In the month of November, we have two significant, distinctly American celebrations. We celebrate the Harvest Feast Day of Thanksgiving, where we remember the pilgrims and members of the Wampanoag tribe sharing a feast together. And of course, we celebrate Veterans Day, where we honor and remember the fine men and women who have served and are currently serving in the U.S. military. But also throughout history, in the month of November, there had been significant strides in the expansion of the gospel. Brave missionaries and organizations that have been raised up to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. In the mid-1800s, the first of these organizations was founded by a man named George Williams. Little did he know that 134 years later, his creation would be made globally famous by a rather flamboyant group of men containing a cop, a construction worker, an Indian, and a cowboy. In 1978, the Village People released their hit single, YMCA, propelling the organization's name to astronomical fame. But to get to the origins of the YMCA, we can't start with a song, but with the grimy streets of London, England in 1844. In the mid-1800s, industrialized London was a pretty bleak place to live. There was great poverty and despair. Many young men migrated to the city from rural areas, searching for jobs, only to find gangs, tenement housing, and dangerous influences. The growth of the railroad and the centralization of commerce was the reason so many people came to the city. Young men were forced to work 10 to 12 hours a day, six days a week. Twenty-two-year-old George Williams, who came to the city as a farmer to become a department store worker, saw the poverty and despair of London, and it changed his life. As a Christian, he felt the need to do something about it. In 1844, Williams and 11 of his friends banded together to organize the first Young Men's Christian Association as a refuge for young men trying to escape life on the London streets. Williams wanted to create a space for young men to put Christian principles into practice by developing a healthy mind, body, and spirit, represented by the three angles on the iconic YMCA triangle. The men participated in Bible studies and prayer during their meetings. The one thing that made the YMCA stand out from other men's meetings occurring during that time was their drive to meet the social needs in the community and being open to any social class. Williams was born in 1821 to a farmer and his wife. He described his younger self as a careless, thoughtless, godless, swearing young fellow. Hard to believe when you look at all he accomplished in his own lifetime, let alone how what he created catapulted into so much more than he could have ever imagined. Fifteen-year-old George first moved to London to be an apprentice to a draper, and by age 20 was working as one himself. His living situation was not ideal, just some accommodations provided by the firm in the same building. This was how most young men lived during this time, living at their workplace, oftentimes in overcrowded rooms above the company's shop. But that was a whole lot safer than being in the tenements and on the streets. George became one of the 150,000 young men, just like him, that crowded the streets of London. Outside, there were open sewers, pickpockets, thugs, beggars, drunks, prostitutes, and abandoned children running wild by the thousands. George wanted to combat what he saw happening on the streets with Bible study and prayer. The first YMCA meeting was held in his own drapery shop in St. Paul's Churchyard. Their objective was the improvement of the spiritual condition of the young men engaged in houses of business by the formation of Bible classes, family, 
and social prayer meetings, mutual improvement societies, or any other spiritual agency. Even though the YMCA was started by evangelicals, it crossed the rigid lines that separated all the different churches and social classes in England. This led the club to accommodate men, women, and children regardless of race, religion, or nationality. As his meetings became more and more successful, Williams wasted no time in organizing YMCA branches all throughout the United Kingdom. By 1851, there were 24 YMCA's in Great Britain. George Williams and his band of friends could never have imagined that the YMCA would spread beyond the island on which they lived. A few years later, a retired Boston sea captain named Thomas Sullivan was inspired by what he'd heard about the Y in England and led the formation of the first U.S. YMCA on December 29th, 1851. Sullivan was working as a marine missionary and noticed the need for a home away from home for sailors and merchants. Then in 1853, the first YMCA for African Americans was founded in Washington, D.C. by Anthony Bowen, who himself was a freed slave. Three YMCA leaders commissioned to develop the movement in Western United States purchased land near Lake Geneva and began a permanent professional YMCA training school called George Williams College. Workers from all across the country would gather there for physical activity, spiritual reflection, and service learning. The school grew quickly, and in 1890, they moved it to a neighborhood of Chicago. It became an institution of higher learning for students entering human service professions like parks and recreation, education, and social work. The original Lake Geneva campus became a college camp and used for retreats. During the Civil War, the Wise formed the U.S. Christian Commission to assist the troops and prisoners of war. They gave more than one million Bibles to men fighting, the beginning of a commitment to working with soldiers and sailors. After the war, they had to rebuild. Their focus was on saving souls through saloon and street corner preaching. Also, providing lists of Christian houses, lectures, libraries, and meeting halls. It wasn't until the 1880s that the YMCA started putting up buildings of their own. These buildings included a variety of gyms, swimming pools, auditoriums, bowling alleys, and dormitories. Inside, the volunteers organized programs to help transform mind, body, and spirit. And then the 1890s led to the creation of basketball and volleyball. It's true, these sports played across the world today were invented by volunteers of the YMCA. More branches of the YMCA started popping up all over the world, including areas of Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and India. The YMCA soon became a global movement with the help of Henry Dunant, who started the first YMCA World Conference bringing together 99 delegates from nine countries. Permanent headquarters were established in Geneva, Switzerland, and it eventually became known as the World YMCA. Because of George Williams' accomplishments, he was knighted by Queen Victoria in 1894, and after his death, he was commemorated in stained glass in the nave of Westminster Abbey. The inscription reads, to the glory of God and in memory of the services rendered through the Young Men's Christian Association during the Great War, 1914 to 1918. And to George Williams, its founder. George Williams was buried in St. Paul's Cathedral in 1905. John Mott, a leader of the YMCA movement in America, was given a Nobel Peace Prize for the YMCA's role in increasing global understanding and for its humanitarian efforts. Mott was a major influence on the Y's missionary movement. The American YMCA's sent out thousands of workers overseas, both as missionaries and war workers. The YMCA's mission survived wars and barriers, and it still exists today.
The Campfire Girls, the Boy Scouts, the Associated Press, and the Peace Corps were organizations inspired and patterned after the YMCA. Today, there are 2,700 branches of the YMCA in the United States, and the Y can be found in nearly 120 countries worldwide. A 30-year-old journalist named Henry Morton Stanley was preparing to set sail from the port of Bagamayo on the eastern coast of Africa for the journey of a lifetime. He worked for the New York Herald newspaper and was tasked with a career-defining rescue mission. Find the famous missionary and explorer, Dr. David Livingston. David Livingston was born to a poor family in Blontyre, United Kingdom, on March 19, 1813. As a young man, he joined an independent Christian congregation, which focused on strict discipline, helping him acquire the characteristics of mind and body that would help him in his African exploration. In 1834, when he was 21 years old, an appeal for qualified medical missionaries in China caused him to become a doctor. He studied Greek, theology, and medicine while working part-time in a mill for two years, and then was accepted by the London Missionary Society. His dreams of going to China specifically waned, but a Scottish missionary in Southern Africa convinced him to focus his efforts on this unknown part of the world. On November 20th, 1840, he was ordained as a missionary and set sail for South Africa. Livingston became very passionate about his work in Africa and developed quite the reputation as a dedicated Christian, courageous explorer, and fervent anti-slavery advocate. Livingston set his sights on undiscovered countries where the population was more numerous. His goal was to spread the gospel through native agents. By 1842, Livingston had gone farther north than any other European into Kalahari country, familiarizing himself with local languages and cultures. As you can imagine, life in Africa in the 1800s wasn't easy especially for a non-native used to the green hills of northern England. One of his famous stories of courage took place in 1844. Livingston was told of a lion in a village that constantly was dragging off villagers' livestock. So, he decided to do something about it. Livingston tracked the lion to an open field and went in with only a shotgun and no backup. This was a terrible mistake. The two shotgun blasts that ripped through the lion did nothing but make it mad. As he tried to reload, the lion lunged forward and latched onto his arm. 
Livingston described himself being thrown back and forth as a terrier dog does a rat. The lion tore through his flesh and broke his arm in several places. Its teeth made gashes like gunshot wounds up and down his arm. Livingston survived, but was terribly injured. Livingston would have had no other doctor to help him or any anesthetic, so it's hard to imagine the pain that he would have endured. He even had to set his badly broken arm himself. The injury was so severe that he would never be able to hold a shotgun steadily again. Livingston married Mary Moffat, and she accompanied him on many travels. But soon enough, health and family needs caused her to stay at home. With his family safe in Scotland, he was able to focus even further on pushing more north with Christianity, commerce, and civilization. He is known to have said, I shall open up a path into the interior or perish. On November 11th, 1853, Livingston set out northward with very little equipment and a few Native Africans. His goal was to establish a route of commerce to the Atlantic coast. He continued to explore the Zambezi region for many years, discovering and naming Victoria Falls on November 16, 1855. He returned to England a national hero. His fame and income from writing about his ministry travels brought his family out of poverty. He then began traveling and speaking. But in 1860, he set out for his second expedition to Africa. He was much more prepared when he set out the second time. He had a paddle steamer, supplies, 10 African helpers, and six Europeans. But there were quarrels that broke out when they found it was nearly impossible to navigate the Zambezi by ship. He decided to take his little vessel with a small, untrained crew on a great voyage across the Indian Ocean. The Zambezi expedition ended up providing a valuable amount of scientific knowledge, and they gained prospective locations for colonization. He also tragically lost his wife, who was with him on his journey. Livingston returned to Africa again in 1866, aiming to extend the reach of the gospel and abolish the slave trade on the east coast of Africa. He also hoped to find the ultimate source of the Nile River on his journey. He encountered many difficulties again on his trip. Between illness and his followers deserting him, amazingly, he pressed on into Central Africa, going farther west than any European had ever traveled. Livingston then returned to Ujiji in present-day Tanzania, where he became very sick. At this point, he had not been heard from in many years. Search parties had even been sent to look for him to no avail. Bringing us back to Henry Stanley's rescue mission. It was a miserable journey making it through swamps, battling malaria, and that was all before narrowly escaping being massacred during a local civil war they encountered. Six months of trekking through Africa, and Stanley was down to 34 men. That was after getting replacements for those who had died or deserted the expedition. But he had taken an oath. He was determined to fulfill his promise to find Livingston, dead or alive. His commitment gave him the strength to persevere during those awful times. Stanley clung to order and inner self-discipline during his trying journey through Africa. A unique habit helped Stanley maintain hope. 
Stanley determined that he would always shave, maintaining an orderly appearance, even in the grimiest of circumstances. Stanley's rescue mission came to an end with his now famous quote, Dr. Livingston, I presume? Stanley finding Livingston was paramount for Livingston's recovery. Stanley had brought much needed food and medicine, which allowed Livingston to regain his strength. He was even able to join Stanley on his own explorations. Livingston did not want to leave Africa though, despite Stanley's pleas. So Stanley returned to England alone in 1872. Livingston, soon after, succumbed to his illness and was found dead, kneeling beside his bed in prayer. But after 30 years of travel and Christian missionary work in southern, central, and eastern Africa, where no European had previously traveled, Livingston influenced Western attitudes towards Africa more than anyone had before him. His geographic, technical, medical, and social discoveries jump-started many new thoughts and ideas that are still being explored today. Livingston's life mission was to open a missionary road, or a God's highway, 1,500 miles north into the interior to bring Christianity and civilization to unreached peoples. He also brought to light the horrors of the slave trade. After Livingston's death, Stanley decided to return to Africa and pick up where Livingston had left off. He visited the King of Buganda, which led to an influx in Christian missionaries in the area, and in 1877, established a British protectorate in Uganda. Stanley also began development of the Congo region by building a road from the lower Congo to what was called Stanley Pool, and was able to launch steamboats on the upper river. This is when he earned his nickname Bula Matari, Breaker of Rocks. This was not an easy mission. In fact, it took a lot of sheer willpower and perseverance. They endured hunger, malaria, dysentery, and festering sores. If that wasn't enough, then they were attacked by natives with poisoned spears and arrows. Not as many made it through that mission as had started. He referred to the area as Darkest Africa, understandably. Stanley's work helped pave the way for the creation of the Congo Free State under the sovereignty of King Leopold of Belgium. His last expedition to Africa was a relief mission of Mohamed Amin Pesa, governor of the equatorial province of Egypt. In the process of this mission, geographic points regarding the sources of the Nile were cleared up for the explorers for the first time. Stanley's reputation grew into the Michael Jordan of explorers, and his friend Dr. Livingston's legacy paled in comparison. Stanley learned Swahili and developed lifelong friendships with his African companions. He disciplined white officers who mistreated Africans and kept his men from violence against the locals. At a young age, Stanley had lost his faith in God when he witnessed the horrors of the American Civil War. But in Africa, he found his calling. When he saw firsthand the devastation of the Arab and East African slave trade, he made it his mission to put an end to it all. He believed it to be a sacred task. Stanley wrote, I was not sent into the world to be happy. I was sent 
for a special work. Thanks to Stanley and his rescue mission, David Livingston was able to continue his exploration and mission work. Today, Livingston and Stanley are regarded around the world as two of history's greatest explorers. Both of them drawn to exploration in order to advance science, abolish the slave trade, and take the gospel to the ends of the earth. In 1898, John Nicholson met Sam Hill for the very first time. They shared a room in a crowded hotel for a night, which became the first moment of the rest of their lives in dedication to delivering God's message to the world. The two men quickly discovered that they shared a common belief in Christ. They decided to have a devotion and prayer time that night they met, and both felt called to develop an association together. May of 1899, Nicholson and Hill met up again a few months later, where they decided their purpose would be to band Christian commercial travelers together for mutual recognition, personal evangelism, and united service for the Lord. They called a meeting about a month later in Janesville, Wisconsin, in a YMCA. Now with only three men showing up for the first meeting, adding Will Knights to the group, some would decide, maybe this association wasn't going to make it but the men were dedicated to seeing their calling through. It was decided that Hill would be president, Knights would be vice president, and Nicholson would be secretary and treasurer. In naming the association, the three men held a special prayer time and asked God to lead them in their decision of the proper name for the group. Knights got up after that prayer time and declared, we shall be called Gideons. Then he read the story of Gideon from the sixth and seventh chapter of Judges. All of the Gideons in the early years of the association were traveling, so their initial focus was how they could be more effective witnesses in hotels. A trustee came up with the idea of putting a Bible in every hotel room in the United States. Adopted in 1908, they called this project the Bible Project an evangelistic act in line with the mission of the Gideon Association. During this month in history, on November 10th, 1908, the Gideons placed their very first Bible in the Superior Hotel in Iron Mountains, Montana. Gideon Archie Bailey was fortunate enough to make the first placement in the Superior Hotel in Superior, Montana. Bailey frequented this hotel a lot and went to the manager asking her what she thought of possibly putting a Bible in each room of her hotel. She thought it was a great idea and made the first order for 25 Bibles from the Gideon headquarters. Bailey paid for this first order himself and then, strangely enough, soon after, he was never heard from again. Soon after, the Ministerial Union, a group of ministers from around the world, decided to take on funding the project. A committee was appointed to allocate the costs to the churches according to their size and strength. Each Bible that is placed in a hotel room has the potential of reaching up to 2,300 people in its six-year lifespan. Hotels believe that around 25% of travelers read the Gideon Bibles. Now over a hundred years after the first Gideon Bible was placed in a hotel room in Montana, more than two billion Bibles and New Testaments have been placed by the grace of God and the support of local churches and donors. Even though hotel rooms are what they are most known for, the Gideons also distribute scriptures in other strategic locations. Bibles are color-coded depending on what group of people they are intended to reach. For example, white Bibles were for medical professionals, green for college students, 
and orange for sidewalk distribution. Gideons personally distribute copies of the Bible to police, fire, medical personnel, prisoners, military, students in the fifth grade and above, and anyone they interact with on a daily basis. They are also placed in hospitals, rehab facilities, medical offices, domestic violence shelters, prisons, and jails. Gideon International now reaches 200 countries in territories across the globe. They are dedicated to help others learn about the love of God by freely making the Bible available. They have been providing Bibles in 58 different languages, truly reaching the ends of the earth with God's Word. Before the YMCA would form or the Gideons would start distributing Bibles, first the gospel had to reach America. You can't have a theme like to the ends of the earth without talking about one of the most famous religious ventures of all time. Before America became the great nation it is today, it took some seriously dedicated people to make the journey. As much as they get the majority of the credit, the Pilgrims weren't actually the first European immigrants to land on the east coast of America. Although the Mayflower's perilous pilgrimage started on September 16, 1620, in reality, their journey starts in 1534 with Henry VIII deciding to break away from the Roman Catholic Church. On November 3rd, 1534, King Henry VIII created the Church of England. He appointed himself the head of his own church with his own rules, basically so he could divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Despite this seismic fracture in the church, many people believed that Henry's new church was still way too similar to the Pope's and wanted even more changes. Some wanted to separate it by getting rid of all Catholic practices. They would become known as the Puritans. The Church of England started dictating all aspects of life, everything from what you could eat to what you could wear. And disobeying these rules was a quick path to ending up dead. Amongst this persecution, the Puritans decided that the only way to form a new group was to break away entirely. And this is what drove the Puritans to the New World. The Mayflower ship is responsible for bringing some of America's first pilgrims. Upon the ship were 102 brave souls. There were 50 men, 19 women, and 33 young adults and children. Only 41 were true Puritan pilgrims seeking religious separation and freedom from the Church of England. The other 61 were considered common folk, merchants, tradesmen, craftsmen, and indentured servants. These European transplants would be the seed that would one day grow into the United States of America. The journey was organized by the Virginia Company, a trading company chartered by King James I with the goal of colonizing parts of the eastern coast of the New World. Stockholders in London financed most of the Pilgrims' voyage with the understanding that they profit from any income from the new settlement. According to their contract with the Virginia Company, their intention was to lay anchor in northern Virginia near the mouth of the Hudson River, where they had been given land on which to settle but the 3,000-mile journey wasn't an easy one. The ship was only designed for hauling cargo and in no way provided any of the comforts of a passenger ship. A 
Along with over 100 passengers, the ship also had 37 crewmen to house. The pilgrims were confined to the gun deck, a suffocating, windowless space between the main deck and the cargo hold below. Between all the supplies and cargo, the total available living space was just 1,000 square feet for over 102 people. Conrad Humphreys, a professional sailor and captain, reported passengers would have had to practically sleep on top of one another. People suffered crippling bouts of seasickness, damp freezing conditions, and survived only on stale bread, dried meat, and beer. Humphreys also says, the journey would have been painfully slow with many days of being blown backwards rather than forwards. To make matters worse, the closer to America they came, the more they realized how far off they were from their destination. The treacherous and violent Northern Atlantic Ocean had blown them nearly 220 miles north off course from their intended destination, the mouth of the Hudson River. Finally, after more than two months at sea on November 9, 1620, the storm-battered Mayflower limped under the shore at Cape Cod. William Bradford, a passenger aboard the Mayflower, documented their joy and relief upon arriving on land. He wrote, being thus arrived in a good harbor and brought safe to land, they fell upon their knees and blessed the God of heaven, who had brought them over the vast and furious ocean and delivered them from all the perils and miseries thereof. Although there were three pregnant women and dozens of children, amazingly, only one of the passengers perished on the grueling 66-day journey. One of the women even gave birth to a baby halfway through the voyage, a boy she appropriately named Oceanus. But arriving in America was only half the battle. Unfortunately, unrest broke out on board before they even disembarked. The non-Puritans started arguing the validity of the Virginia Company's contract. Since they weren't taken to Virginia, they were no longer bound to the company's charter. The non-Puritans also refused to recognize Virginia's laws because they were outside of its jurisdiction. And in Massachusetts, there was no official government. Pilgrim leader William Bradford later wrote that several of the passengers had made discontented and mutinous speeches. The pilgrims feared that if something wasn't done quickly, it would soon become every man and woman for themselves. Before they departed the ship and began their new life in the new world, they had to figure out some very practical ways for self-governance. They knew life here in the new world without laws could prove disastrous. Pilgrim leaders aboard the ship created a document ensuring everyone would abide by the same laws and that a functioning social structure would prevail in their new settlement. This document became known as the Mayflower Compact. month in history, on November 11th, 1620, the Mayflower Compact was completed and signed by 41 male adults aboard the ship. They elected John Carver governor on November 21st, 1620. The new leader seemed to calm the rising rebellion within the group. The pilgrims knew that productive, law-abiding people were essential to the survival and success of the new colony. With that in mind, the document they created was short and poignant. The main points were, the colonists would remain loyal subjects to King James, despite their need for self-governance. The colonists would create and enact laws, ordinances, acts, constitutions, and offices for the good of the colony and abide by those laws. The colonists would create one society and work together to further it. The colonists would live in accordance with the Christian faith. 
Once the document was signed, a new sense of camaraderie was rekindled. The hard work of building the colony could now begin. They started by sailing along the coast and sending search parties ashore to find an ideal place to settle. A few weeks later, in late December, they dropped anchor at Plymouth Rock. Here, the Pilgrims formed the first permanent settlement of Europeans in New England. Unfortunately, things would soon take a terrible turn. The arriving winter brought deadly cold. Without proper shelter and food supply, the colonists were brutalized by freezing temperatures, disease, and starvation. It's said that more than half of the colonists perished during that winter. Miraculously, the Plymouth colony survived. It's later said that the Mayflower Compact was crucial in solidifying the colonists' dedication to each other and their mission. After that winter, the colony thrived. More and more settlers would soon arrive and colonize the surrounding areas. With the Mayflower Compact as a central ruling declaration, a general court was established as an early form of government. Each town elected representatives to attend and vote on new acts and laws. The Mayflower Compact was massively significant in the New World because it was the first document to establish self-government. It was the first successful attempt in the New World to form self-government without the rule of a king. It remained active for several decades until 1691, when Plymouth Colony was absorbed by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. It undoubtedly played a huge role in future colonists wanting to seek independence from British rule. This brave group of 100 pilgrims risked their lives to seek religious freedom and at the same time helped lay the foundation of what would eventually become the United States of America. From Puritan Protestantism came all of the great American denominations we know today. For the past several centuries, Europe and the United States have been responsible for raising millions of missionaries to spread the gospel at the corners of the globe. In America, it all started with the Pilgrims. From there, the YMCA, the Gideons Association, and our British brothers, David Livingston and Henry Stanley, took the gospel to the ends of the earth. I hope you've enjoyed looking back at what happened this month in Christian history. What I love about studying the past is that one moment in time can open up loads of incredible history. No matter how much life we've lived, we can all learn so much from the believers that have gone before us. The peaks and valleys that they endured can prepare us to pioneer our own paths. But most of all, they can inspire us to trust in the God who holds all of history in his hands. I'm Cody Crouch. I hope you'll join me next time on This Month in Christian History. Until then, go make some history of your own.